So, welcome everyone to Earth Day Every Day. I'm Amy Rowe. I am a Rutgers Cooperative Extension agent up in Essex and Passaic counties. I'll be your host for tonight. And I am going to go over some logistics and then we'll get right to our presentation. So just bear with me. Uh, so in case you don't know, Rutgers Cooperative Extension is the outreach arm of the university. So we bring the knowledge and research from all those scientists at at Rutgers and we bring it out to the local community out in the local counties um, but obviously right now during the pandemic we are virtual which is why we have our Earth Day Every Day webinar series and the purpose of this series is to to provide you some information that you can use to be more sustainable at home to be more eco-friendly to be aware of of the environment and the the ecosystem that is New Jersey uh, and so by the end of this talk you'll have some some steps you can take some actions uh, to be to be um, to be more sustainable and to be more um, more aware of your environment especially with our our defensive driving uh, webinar that we're going to have tonight and so before we get started, I want to go over some logistics of how to use WebEx. If you have questions, you're going to put the questions in the chat box. In order to get to the chat box, there should be a little blue cartoon bubble in the bottom right corner of your control panel. Just click on that. You should be able to type your message in there. We'll be taking questions uh, every you know, we'll be stopping the speaker every now and then to to have some some questions, and uh, hopefully we won't get too many that it derails our our presentation. But we will try to answer as many questions as possible. So thank you for your patience as we try to manage you know the fine balance of letting the presenter speak and answering questions. So please put them in the chat box. There's also a Q and A, but uh, the chat box would be best. Um, so please go ahead and, and type your messages in the chat box. Um, so also, you are all muted, which is why you need to use the chat box. Um, so um, don't think that you can unmute yourself. We'll be, we'll be keeping everybody quiet. But please, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat. Uh, also, about 10 minutes before the end of the presentation, we'll be giving you a survey, a poll, so that we know how we did tonight. We just want to get your feedback. We want to know what you learned. We want to know what actions you're planning to take uh, with the information that you're getting from this talk. And so the polling chat box should pop up once I open the poll. Um, so that should be near the end of the evening, like 7.20, 7.25. So just be on the lookout for that. And Kathleen, if you could move the next slide, please. Sure. Uh, so in order to participate in the poll, I need to talk to you about a human research consent. Uh, you basically are a research subject uh, as part of this. And so we, as Rutgers, need to make sure that we have your consent to participate in research studies. And so this is all the information that you need about what we're trying to do, um, about whether your information will be confidential. So please read this and just be aware that at the beginning of the poll, you will be asked if you consent to take the survey. So please say yes if you are comfortable with that. If you are not comfortable, you do not have to participate in the poll. But we do really appreciate your feedback. So please um, just be aware you do not have to do not have to participate, but we would really like your participation. So take a look at this slide while I'm talking and just please click yes, you consent on the survey. Otherwise, just skip the survey. So thank you for participating. We really appreciate that. OK, then finally, um, we are offering the Earth Day Every Day series as a free, um, a free service to you. But our programs do require support. And so we are offering you the chance to support this program by donating 
to our environmental stewards program, which is one of our, our big um, flagship programs in our department. So I will put the information on how to donate in the chat box and uh, you can feel free to donate. Any amount would help, um, but we are trying to keep these um, webinar is affordable and we appreciate any support that you can provide for us. Okay, I think we are through most of the logistics, so Kathleen, go ahead to your next slide and I will introduce you formally. Uh, so tonight we are very lucky to have Kathleen Kerwin. She is with the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources as part of the Wildlife Management um, and Wildlife Extension Specialist, uh, Brooke Maslow. Dr. Brooke Maslow is her supervisor, and we are so excited to have uh, the wildlife folks here with us tonight. And Kathleen has been a supporter of the Earth Day Every Day and the Earth Day, um, Earth Day at Home series in the spring. So this is her, her second time around with us, and we really appreciate the support. So today she will be talking about offensive driving to avoid wildlife vehicle collisions. And we will also be having another talk from the wildlife management people uh, around Halloween. So make sure you check back and look at the schedule for that. But in the meantime, please welcome Kathleen and I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Amy. Um, thanks for hosting us. Welcome to the first ever Wild Are You Wildlife Wise webinar. Um, and I will also plug our next one, which will be about Halloween animals. Uh, that will be given by one of our graduate students. He's a very um, enthusiastic prevent, uh, present, presenter. Um, so definitely stay tuned to that. Thank you. Um, and let's get to it. All right. So we will be talking about wildlife vehicle collisions. And obviously, there's going to be a big um, emphasis on deer. And I'm sure that a lot of us can relate to this meme. Um, I assume that most of us tuning in are from New Jersey or the surrounding area uh, where the possibility of hitting a deer with your car um, is pretty high, or it seems that way. Um, and we can all probably relate to this type of deer that seems to be crazy for wanting to run out in front of us um, for seemingly no reason. So I will be going over some deer biology uh, to make sense of why this happens. But besides some um, defensive driving tips, I'm also going to be talking about some statistics. So going over wildlife vehicle collision statistics uh, throughout the country, but also specifically to New Jersey. Uh, we're going to talk about why these types of collisions occur in the first place, again, with a special look at white-tailed deer ecology and behavior. Then we're going to go into some consequences, so what happens if you do get into one of these accidents, um, including personal injury, uh, what happens to insurance, um, and also what are some consequences to wildlife, and then we'll get into the, the driving part. So first off, let's take a look at the U.S. as a whole, kind of the state of affairs, what's going on in terms of wildlife vehicle collisions. So if you're driving around on any road in the U.S., your chances of hitting an animal are about 1 in 116, 116. Uh, and that doesn't just include wildlife. Those statistics are including all animals, so domestic animals that might be loose on the road, like cats or dogs, or in some parts of the country you might be hitting cattle or something like that. It's important to note that smaller mammals are not usually represented in these stats because typically if you hit a squirrel or a rabbit or something like that, you're not gonna go and pull over and report it. Um, you're probably just gonna feel sad and go on with your day. Um, and they really don't usually cause much damage to your vehicle. Also important to note that accidents caused by swerving to avoid an animal usually get reported as something else, so a collision with a roadside object or another vehicle because you swerved, um, and they're also not typically included with these statistics. Um, so it's actually probably a lot higher of a chance um, that you would hit something um, if we're including all the animals out there. Um, but one interesting fact is that over 90% of these collisions that we are referencing happen with deer. 
And in some states, automobile accidents um, with deer account for a quarter of the state's harvest, um, which is a lot. Um, and the other 75% would come from hunting. So in some states, a lot of deer are hit. Um, so this slide just so shows uh, some general trends. Um, on the left, we see a graph uh, that was reported to, uh, it was included in a report to Congress back in 2008 from the U.S. Department of Transportation Federal Highway Administration. Uh, and this data, they were looking at data from between 1990 and 2004. And at the top, you see all vehicle crashes in the U.S. So all crashes, no matter what the cause was, um, hovered around above, a little above 6 million per year, 6 million car crashes every year in the U.S. At this, during that same time period, if you look at the bottom, the ABC on the axis there stands for animal vehicle crashes. So now looking at the very specific um, you know, just crashes that are caused by animals. And that, over that same time period, um, increased by about 50%. So even though car crashes in general staying about the same, um, we're seeing this like pretty big increase in, in wildlife vehicle collisions or animal vehicle collisions. This is corroborated with another study I found uh, that we look at on the right. Um, this was published in the Journal of Safety Research and looking at a similar time period between 1990 and 2008, we see that um, there is this upward trend in the percentage of animal vehicle crashes. So starting in 1990, animal vehicle crashes made up about 3% of the total car crashes in the U.S., uh, but as we go on uh, through time, they end up making up about 5%. So not, not a huge amount, but there is this increase. And at the bottom, we're looking at fatalities caused by wildlife vehicle crashes. And again, there is this um, upswing um, through 2008. Uh, and this has actually leveled off. So we are at about uh, averaging a little over 200 fatalities every year in the U.S. from animal vehicle collisions or wildlife vehicle collisions. There's a few reasons cited for this in both of these reports, um, one being just the Increase in miles driven, especially in more suburban and rural areas as people's commutes probably increased during the 90s and early 2000s. Um, but also uh, because most of these crashes are because of deer, um, there, ha there was a very large increase in the deer population during this time as well, um, which probably accounts for this upswing. And we will be talking about deer populations and why they are so high. Here is a map put together by State Farm Insurance, and this looks at the likelihood in each state that you would collide with an animal. And so they group states into three major categories. You have high-risk states in the black, uh, medium-risk states in gray, and low-risk states in that light gray color. Um, so when, when, they, when they're um, saying 1 in 80 or 1 in 54, and we'll, we'll use West Virginia as an example because they have repeatedly um, been named the most dangerous state to drive in. They're always number one. Um, it's, it's a 1 in 38 chance of hitting, hitting an animal. Um, and what that means is 1 in 38 drivers that year reported some sort of insurance um, loss uh, claim due to a wildlife incident. Now looking a little more specifically at New Jersey, this actually surprised me. I thought we would rank a little bit higher, uh, but we're ranked 36 uh, in the country with a one in 155 chance of getting into an animal vehicle collision. Uh, again, just as a reminder, the national average was one in 116. So not as bad as some other states. But that still accounts for a lot of accidents. Uh, between 2014 and 2017, New Jersey had almost 60,000 wildlife vehicle incidents. And they can cost about $150 million per year. So it's, it's a pretty sizable amount. I thought it would be fun to list out the top 10 most dangerous towns to drive in. 
Uh, I think we had someone here from Tom's River. So you're ranked number five. This is according to 2017 data. Uh, and this is just looking at the number of animal loss claims uh, per town that were submitted that year. Um, it is interesting to note that most of these towns are pretty big, over 30 square miles, uh, most of them. Um, and a lot of them have a lot of great deer habitat. They're a mixture of suburbs, rural areas, agricultural areas. So this makes sense um, that they would have more animal loss claims. I grew up in Somerville, so not too hard not too far from Hillsborough in Somerset County. I have very vivid memories driving back from soccer practice with my mom and her just completely avoiding certain roads because she was convinced we were gonna hit a deer. And I should tell her that um, she was probably right looking back. So now we'll talk about why, why these uh, vehicle, wildlife vehicle collisions occur. And that might seem like a silly question, um, but it's important to go over just why, like why that happens. And really, all animals have to move across the landscape um, to find certain resources, whether that's food, water, or mates. Um, they all have to move some amount of distance to be able to find those things in order to survive and reproduce. Some animals have to move farther than others. So for example, these bobcats or even black bears, and they're traveling miles and miles per day. So chances are they're going to have to cross a lot of roads. So wildlife in New Jersey, um, unfortunately, have a lot of roads to deal with. And in this map, uh, which I took from um, the Change Project, which is run through the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife, um, CHANGE stands for Connecting Habitat Across New Jersey, and their entire mission is to try and make wildlife habitat in New Jersey more connected, because New Jersey has so many roads, actually the densest roadway network in the U.S. And if we look at these red lines on the map, those represent roads that have over 10,000 vehicles every single day um, that are driving through. So a lot of high volume roads that you can imagine if you're a wildlife species trying to roam around looking for food and water and mates, that would be a very difficult landscape to, to go across. And again, the most common animal to hit out there is the white-tailed deer. Um, white-tailed deer are what we have out east, but there's actually two other deer species in North America. We have the mule deer and the black-tailed deer. Um, so a lot of these national stats are just including deer in general, but it's actually those three species. And if we look at animal loss claims from 2014 to 2017, just as an example, um, the, the top five animals to hit are deer, raccoon, dog, turkey, and coyote. But if you look at the yellow highlighted columns, you'll see that deer make up far more than all of the others combined. Again, it's about 90% of total um, animal vehicle collisions are because of deer. Are there any questions so far? So nothing so far. Okay. Um, now we will talk about white-tailed deer ecology. So why, why is it that deer are the ones that are the most likely to hit with your car? Like why is that? Number one, populations are very high, um, and we're going to talk about why that is. Um, some of the reasons include there's been a local extinction of predators. So, you know, back before European colonization of North America um, on the east, there would have been local populations of wolves and eastern cougars right here in New Jersey that would have preyed upon deer and helped keep their populations um, in a balance. We obviously do not have wolves in New Jersey anymore. Um, some people are convinced we have eastern cougars, but there is no evidence that they still exist here in New Jersey. So um, those are the top two predators that deer would have had that they no longer have. There is a thriving coyote population in New Jersey, and they will prey upon deer fawns, so the young deer, or maybe sick or injured adults. 
but there's no real data suggesting that coyotes have any significant impact on deer populations overall. Deer also have a high reproductive rate, especially somewhere like New Jersey. They have a lot of protected areas. They have a lot of food with our forests, with the edge habitat that I'll talk about, um, agricultural fields. It's very common for white-tailed deer in New Jersey to have three fawns um, all the time, like every year. So their populations can grow very, very quickly. There's also a, an issue with lack of hunting. So now their biggest predator is, is people and hunting. Um, but most of New Jersey is privately owned. And in many cases, people don't want hunters on their property or in cases where people are living in suburbs or closely, you know, close together, obviously hunting's not allowed. So there's a lot of refugia for deer to hide out during the hunting season. And then a big reason um, that populations are high are because of this habitat fragmentation, which creates a lot of edge habitat. So deer are what are known as an edge species because they like living on the edge of habitats. You won't usually find them in the middle of the woods. You're gonna find them in that transitional spot where forest um, becomes a field or an agricultural field or a suburb. That's where, we, that's where deer like to be. And there's this common misconception. Um, I've heard it a lot. People that live in the suburbs and maybe don't know a lot about deer ecology, a lot of times I've, I've heard them say, well, you know, we shouldn't hunt the deer. We shouldn't, um, we should leave them alone because we're living in their habitat. And this is where they used to live before we built our house here. And that's actually not true. Um, and I'm going to try and show you why. So again, habitat fragmentation equals more edge. So if we look at this picture, we can imagine that at one time, this probably was one contiguous piece of forest, but these developments were put in, maybe a field was put in for agriculture. It was carved up into these tiny slivers of forest. So what once would have had maybe edge just on the, you know, on the surrounding edges of this big piece of woods, we now have exponentially more edge because of it being carved up. So before humans really started modifying the east, the northeast of New Jersey, uh, and we had a lot more forested habitat, um, our best guess is that deer occurred here at about five to 10 per square mile, and that was what our landscape could support. But with this type of habitat where there's no predators and there's an so much more habitat for them and so much more protection, um, we're seeing deer at levels of over 100 per square mile. So not five to 10, but over 100, places like Princeton and, and Hillsboro. Um, it's, it's, it's not sustainable for the landscape. So not only is it um, an issue for driving because you're more likely to hit the deer, um, but our forests are suffering because all these deer have to eat so much food. Um, they're eating a lot of our understory plants, which then affects habitat for songbirds and, and other species. Um, it's affecting our agricultural community because deer are eating so much of the crop. Um, so it's a big issue, um, but I just wanted to go over why uh, there are so many deer in New Jersey and really throughout most of their range um, in the U.S. Now, the number two reason um, you're more likely to hit deer is because of their biology. So we'll talk about the breeding season. The breeding season for deer is referred to as the rut, and it runs from September through January. Peak rut in New Jersey occurs in November. And what triggers the rut to start is actually the photo period or the amount of daylight that we have um, in the day. So as days start to get shorter, deer start producing melatonin, and that melatonin um, makes their hypothalamus and their pituitary glands start producing these breeding hormones, which are testosterone and estrogen. So as that happens, they are launched into the rut. And the rut can be broken down into three main sections. We have the pre-rut, so that's late summer, 
early fall, and that's when bucks or the males, they start establishing territories and they're moving around more and they start sparring or fighting with each other. They're trying to establish dominance. As we go into the full rut, which is November, um, does or the females um, start to become in estrus. And deer are only in estrus for one to two days, so it's a very short period. And because of that, the bucks will follow does around until they're ready to breed. So they're, the bucks during this time are not really eating, they're not sleeping, they're like barely doing these basic things they need to do to stay alive because they are so focused on breeding. As we get into the post rut, um, any doe that was not bred will actually cycle back into estrus. So there will still be some breeding that goes on um, this late in the season, but for the most part, it's calmed down. These bucks are on a feeding frenzy. They are trying to gain back all that weight that they lost um, and things start to calm down. But except, uh, October through December um, are usually pretty active times for deer. And if we look at the animal loss claims data, this shows up pretty obviously uh, when you look at the amount of claims submitted per month during a year. So we have October and November that really stand out as the two months that have the most amount of claims and December um, higher than average as well. So um, these are the most dangerous months that you can be driving in. And this is the reason why, is because it coincides with that, um, with that breeding season of the deer. So now let's talk about consequences. So if you hit a deer, you know, what, what happens? Well, deer are pretty big. And in some cases, it can be pretty bad. This woman, luckily, was unharmed. This was from Howell. And this eight-point eight point buck actually went through her windshield into her back seat. And I don't know how she was unharmed, but this is a crazy story. Besides, obviously, vehicle damage, there can be secondary motor vehicle crashes, injury, personal injury, as well as death in some cases. A lot of emotional trauma that can happen from hitting, um, I mean, small animals, it's, it's hard to deal with emotionally, but especially hitting a bigger animal, um, that can be really tough. Um, travel delays that are caused from big accidents, uh, the involvement of law enforcement, emergency services, road maintenance crews, that's all involving our, our taxpayer money. Um, if you run into a guardrail or knock over a utility pole, there, you know, these agencies, transportation, transportation agencies, uh, utility companies, they all have to come out and, and make these infrastructure repairs, as well as carcass removal. Um, all of these costs can really add up. If we look specifically at personal injury and fatalities, um, on average, 211 people well, not on average, 211 people died in 2017 um, from wildlife vehicle strikes. On average, over the last few years, it's been about 200 or a little above 200. In New Jersey specifically, we had 13 fatal accidents in 2016 and approximately 26,000 injuries every single year in the U.S. Um, due to these vehicle collisions. Most serious crashes occur when drivers are swerving to avoid an animal. And we're gonna talk about that again, but um, if, if you think about it, instead of just hitting through the animal, um, people swerve at the last minute going high speeds, that's when you get these very serious crashes. People go into oncoming traffic, veer off the road and hit a pole or a tree, um, and then we get these really bad car crashes. Um, I think I see a question. Yeah, so is it true that deer are more active during sunrise and sunset, so more accidents occur at that time? Yes, that is absolutely correct, and I, I think I forgot to mention it. Uh, thank you. Deer are more active during dusk and dawn. So there, there's another graph I didn't include, but if you look at time of day, 
most accidents are occurring during those time periods. Um, and unfortunately, that coincides when we're losing light of the day. So people can't see as far. Um, so it's not only deer are more active then, but it's also, it's harder for us to, to see them. Um, so it kind of goes hand in hand, and that is definitely when most accidents occur. Um, so that's when people should be really vigilant when they're driving, especially. Anything else? That's all for now. Okay. So let's talk quickly about insurance. So unfortunately, if you hit a deer or other wildlife and it causes damage to your vehicle, the only coverage where um, this damage would be paid for by your insurance is through comprehensive coverage. And if you have collision coverage, it, it, it seems weird because you think if you hit a deer, you collide with something, but it's actually not covered under collision coverage. That only covers repair costs if you hit another car or an object. So hitting a deer falls under those unpredictable act categories. So you get not only wildlife collisions, but you get coverage uh, for theft, fire, and vandalism. This type of coverage is not required by any state law, um, but I did talk to a few insurance companies and they, um, they did say comprehensive coverage is a lot cheaper than collision coverage. So if you have maybe an older car and you don't wanna pay for collision coverage, it might be a good idea um, to look into comprehensive coverage, especially if you live in somewhere like Hillsboro or Tom's River, or one of these areas where hitting a deer is actually pretty likely. Um, and right now, the average cost of a wildlife vehicle collision car claim is over $4,000. Um, so without this coverage, you'd have to pay all of that out of pocket. Um, you know, check with your own insurance company to see if that's something that would be right for you. Um, I know rates um, depend on, you know, your past driving history and your rates could be affected. If you did get comprehensive coverage um, and you, for some reason, kept hitting deer after deer, um, your rates would go up. Um, I couldn't get a straight answer as to how much, but it really just depends on the situation. But if you live in one of these high-risk areas, it might be worth looking into getting this type of coverage. We've been talking a lot about the consequences for us when we hit wildlife, but I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the consequences for wildlife. And there's no indication that um, mortality from car crashes will have really any significant effect on our deer populations, but there's a lot of other vulnerable um, species that when they're hit a lot by cars, um, this can really impact their local population levels. It can um, impact their movement. And there's actually at least 21 federally listed threatened or endangered species in the U.S. where road mortality is one of the major threats to their survival, as well as habitat fragmentation and development and other things like that. But road mortality is a big thing. Um, and that's not just the furry mammals, but also our reptiles and our amphibians and birds. Um, I think there was an example of a Hawaiian goose um, where it actually has to cross a lot of roads with, with its young, and that's when it's getting hit by, by cars. And this photo, we, it's just an eastern box turtle, which we have in New Jersey. Um, he unfortunately got hit by a car and was with a wildlife rehabber for two years before he was able to be released back out in the wild. Here's a figure that I took again from that change, uh, Connecting Habitat Across New Jersey report, um, which was printed originally in the Handbook of Road Ecology, but it really just emphasizes that not only are we thinking about the direct mortality that roads um, cause on wildlife, but how they're really affecting um, some animals' behaviors. So in some cases, yes, animal tries to cross the road, it gets hit. That's the top um, orange line. Next down, we have attraction. So that would be like in the case of a turtle or a snake that sees a road as this nice, hot, um, like sun-soaked area that it can bask and, and absorb heat. And it might be attracted to the road and then get hit. Or maybe there's some good habitat on the side of the road where they could dig a nest and lay their eggs and then also um, maybe try and cross and get hit. 
in this other uh, in this next example, um, roads can be a serious um, like barrier or filter to movement. So some wildlife might cross and get through. Others would try and cross and get hit. Others might not try to cross, but then have to go a different direction. Um, and some might just be totally avoiding roads in the first place because they don't even want to get close to that habitat that's next to the road, which is typically very degraded. Um, so they won't even come close to a road. And that can be a serious issue too for some species. Um, if they're bounded, if their population is bounded by roads that they can't cross, you get issues with inbreeding and, and genetic issues, um, lack of resources. So this can be, roads can manifest in many different ways as issues for wildlife species. I just wanted to include this example with bobcats again. Um, it's a pretty cool um, map, again, from that change report, showing the movement of 11 bobcats that had a radio collar put on uh, between 2002 or 2000, and 2016, and just showing their movement. So each different color is a, is a different bobcat individual. And again, these, these um, red lines are representing roads where over 10,000 vehicles are traveling every day, so major highways. And you can see how the bobcat movements are very bounded by these roads. Um, they might go across them a few times, but um, there really is um, a, a significant effect on their movement. And just as a side note, 15 bobcats were killed by cars in 2019 in New Jersey, so quite a few. Um, a lot of those were juveniles, so they probably weren't aware of, 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 you know, they didn't, they weren't smart with roads yet, like maybe some of the adults can be, um, but just something to be aware of. Hey, Kathleen, can I yeah. interrupt you for yep. a second? Yep. I'm going to start the poll, everybody, so you will have 20 minutes to take the poll, and hopefully it popped up. Uh, for you. I see a lot of you starting, so thank you. But go ahead and, and take the poll while you're listening to the end of Kathleen's talk. And I see we have a question. Let me just get you that while we're taking a break for a minute. Do deer and other animals use those over-the-concrete highway animal corridors, like the one built over Route 78? Yes, um, I, I don't know a lot of the specifics with that, but I know the change project um, puts a lot of effort into figuring out the best places for those types of um, crossings. And that can be either an over the highway crossing or an under the highway crossing. Um, and I know they do a lot of research. Um, they use GIS to figure out the best habitats uh, for different species and how to connect them at certain points where they know animals are, are, are traveling a lot. Um, so yes, those those are used, uh, but they need to be managed, and they're pretty expensive, I think, to put in a lot of the time. So um, there has to be a lot of planning and logistical research done to just figure out uh, the best bang for the buck. Like where could you put in one of those um, crossings so that the most you know the most amount of species will use it, and and it'll be connecting the best types of habitat. Um, hopefully that answered your question. All right, should I continue on? Uh, yeah, that's all for now. Thank you. Okay. All right, so now we'll get to the driving component. And we'll talk about how to avoid these types of collisions in the first place. So a lot of these are you know, pretty obvious, but they're just good, good reminders. Number one, slow down. So like we talked about, especially during the rut, during these fall months, early winter, the days are getting shorter, you have less light, you're gonna be commuting um, and you're not gonna be able to see it as, as, as well because it's gonna be dark out earlier, um, especially around dusk and dawn. This is when deer especially are most active, but many other wildlife are very active at dusk and dawn. So just slow down, don't speed, go the speed limit or go slower, um, just, it's worth just going slow. Um, pay attention. Luckily, a lot of mammals, if you shine a light in their eyes, there is a reflective a reflection that comes back. So that's called eye shine. 
So as you're driving, just constantly scan the side of the road for that eye shine. And if you have people in the car with you, ask them for help. Say, hey, can you help me just check, check for deer? You know, it's the rut. It's dusk. Like, this is prime time for a deer to run out in the road. Like, you know, help me, help me look out for them. Use high beams if you can. So if there's no oncoming traffic or no one's directly in front of you, put on your high beams. It's worth it. It'll increase your field of view. You'll be able to see a lot better. Um, it's, you know, there's no reason not to as long as there's no one that you're going to be uh, blinding with them. Don't tailgate. So if the, if the car in front of you has to suddenly break for wildlife, you do not want to be tailgating them. You will rear end them or your chances of rear ending them will increase. So just keep a safe distance again during the rut, dusk and dawn. But in general, that's a good thing not to tailgate, um, but especially in cases for wildlife. Another piece of advice is that deer often move in herds. So if you see one, you're probably going to see more or there's probably more um, not far behind, especially during the rut. Again, if you see a female, a doe, dart in front of the road or through the road, there's a pretty high chance that there's going to be a buck pretty close behind her. So just be aware. If you see one, good chance that there's going to be more around. If you see wildlife actually crossing the road in front of you, there's a few things you should do. I remember when I learned how to drive, uh, my instructor actually asked me this question. He said, what, what do you do if you see an animal on the road? I said, I'll, I'm gonna brake. And he said, no, the first thing you should do is actually look in your rear view mirror to see who's behind you. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. And it doesn't take long, it takes half a second to just glance up at your rear view mirror because that gives you information to then make more decisions. If there's someone, you know, really close tailgating you, you're not going to be able to slam on your brakes without getting rear-ended. If there's no one behind you, you can slam on those brakes and try and come to a stop if necessary. If there's people coming, tap your brakes because that can give a good warning to them that, hey, something's up, like take a look ahead. So slow down if you can and give yourself plenty of time to do so. Wait for that animal to pass. I've heard lots of stories of people that slow down and they have the deer on the side of the road and they're trying to maneuver around the deer and all of a sudden that deer just bolts and actually hits the car. So it's not that the person ran into the deer, it's the deer ran into them. And again, it's breathing hormones, they're acting erratically, they're, they're running, they're getting spooked. Um, just give the deer or any wildlife space um, let them go on their own, let them pass fully. Beeping can help um, get them out of the way. I did come across in my research um, people installing deer whistles or something on the, on the front of their car. Those don't work. There's no evidence that those work. So don't install one thinking I'm going to be fine. The deer, you know, can hear me. Um, so there's no evidence that that works. So just beeping, flash your head, um, high beams and just wait for it to leave. If collision is inevitable and you're gonna hit that animal, remain calm, hold the wheel of your vehicle steady and brake firmly up until right before contact with the animal. Um, I read that there's some evidence that if you brake and continue braking when you hit the animal, that can increase the likelihood of that deer actually going through your windshield. If you let off the brake and there's a little forward momentum, that can help propel the deer away from you. Most importantly, and if you don't remember anything else from this talk tonight, remember to stay in your lane and don't swerve. If, there's, if it's inevitable that you're going to crash into an animal, especially something large like a deer, don't swerve because this is how the most serious accidents occur. Swerving can cause you to lose control of your vehicle, go into oncoming traffic, hit a tree, lose control, 
and you're way more likely to get a serious injury or hurt someone else or even die because you lost control of that vehicle and got into a really bad accident. It'll always, it, it could be a lot worse than just driving through um, the animal, which I know sounds harsh, but um, it's the safest thing. If you do hit a deer or another species that causes um, damage to your car, um, but you can still operate the vehicle, pull over to a safe area on the shoulder, turn on your hazard lights, um, and call emergency services. Another good piece of advice is, is, say you hit a deer and it's injured and it's laying there, do not approach it. This can also cause some serious injury. The deer is probably gonna be scared um, and act erratically, it could kick you. Um, you don't wanna go anywhere near it. Call emergency services, um, they'll be able to handle it. Um, and then contact your ins insurance agency as soon as possible, um, report the damages, take pictures, um, really do what you would with any normal accident. And that is it. I'll answer any more questions. Okay, thank you. So somebody was asking about those deer whistles, so thank okay. you for answering that. <laughs> Jeffrey says that he's noticed that if a doe crosses the road, it is likely that her fawns will cross blindly behind her. So he usually puts on his hazards and waits for everybody to cross. Yeah, that's really good advice. I, I wasn't even thinking about fawns. I was thinking more about um, the rat, but that's really good advice. Yeah, fawns, and there could be one, two, three, you, you know, you don't, you don't always know. So. They definitely move in herds, and that's great. Put your hazards on, let them cross, then you can go. Okay, then someone asked if you can repeat the part about braking when a collision is inevitable, so you let up on the brake before impact? Right, so what I read was that if, if you wanna brake and slow your car down because, you know, the slower you can get your vehicle, the less damage there will be. Um, but I guess there's some evidence to suggest that if you let off that brake, so you're then propelling forward, um, it can help push that deer away instead of having it slide up into your windshield. Um, I'd have to look more into that, but that, that, is, that is what I read. Um, just to try and prevent that picture like I showed with that deer ending up in your back seat. Um, that, that would be scary. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then uh, there's a question. Is anyone looking at the effect of less driving during the pandemic on animal vehicle collisions? That's a great question. And I was, I don't know, um, but I was thinking that, especially with those maps, looking at those um, highways where over 10,000 vehicles a car a, a day are, are driving. I was thinking like, well, it's, that must be a lot less, you know, during shutdown and pandemic. I wonder how that affected wildlife movement. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't. I don't think anyone's looking at that, or not that I'm aware of. But that would be really interesting to study. Yeah. So Irene says she seems to see that people are driving almost as much as before the pandemic. So maybe no real yeah. difference. <laughs> Uh, then just a reminder to fill out the poll. Uh, if you haven't already, please make sure that you hit submit. Otherwise, we won't see your answers. But thank you so much for helping us on that. All right, let's see. Let's see what else we got. Um, all right. Well, that seems to be all the questions. Uh, so do you want to talk about the the Halloween um, webinar that's coming up in a couple weeks? Yeah, I highly recommend watching it. Um, we're going to be talking about bats, owls, coyotes, vultures, um, and it's all going to be why those animals are related to Halloween, but then also include some ecology and some management strategies in case you have issues with those types of animals. Um, but the presenter is going to be Evan Drake. He's a graduate student in the ecology department. He's a fantastic presenter. He's very entertaining, very knowledgeable. So I definitely, definitely um, suggest tuning into that one. 
Okay, so just to remind you, that one is October 26th. It's a Monday. It's three weeks from today. And we have Evan in the chat. He says, oh. Please come and listen. And Steve has put his has put the summary in there, but there's a question, is the Halloween presentation kid friendly? It should be. I don't Evan can answer, but it should be. Yeah, Evan. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too scary. Well, he said you better believe it. <laughs> okay, so please bring your kids. Um and Steve has put the the registration link right there in the chat. Um, but yeah, we can talk for a little while, but while we have some downtime, let's thank Kathleen for this awesome presentation. I learned a lot. I never would have let up on the break when I'm about to hit a deer, so <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, but lots of people are saying great information, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. We appreciate your supporting the Earth Day Everyday program, and we look forward to the next Rutgers Wildlife Talk again, October 26th with Evan. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, next week, because of Columbus Day, October 12th, we are not meeting on Monday. Uh, we will be meeting Tuesday, October 13th. And that presentation, hold on, that presentation will be the, um, let's see. It's the energy audit. Yes, what is an energy audit and do you need one? We are partnering with New Jersey's Clean Energy Program. They did our very first uh, webinar in this fall series, so they'll be back with us. So please don't forget it's Tuesday, October 13th, not Monday. Um, but yeah, we really appreciate Kathleen and the support from the wildlife management folks at Rutgers. Thank Dr. Maslow for having you out with us. And we're looking forward to Evan uh, in a couple weeks. So everybody's saying keep up the great work, but I don't see any more questions. People saying it's scary knowing you may come across a deer. It's uh, It seems inevitable. It feels inevitable in New Jersey um, that you'll at least have some close calls Um there. Yeah, I I really thought we would be ranked uh, a little higher in the country, but yeah, yeah, I guess maybe because of all those really urban areas like Camden and Newark and Elizabeth, yeah, um, Patterson, maybe we're we're a little lower in this really dense state. Oh, mm -hmm. Evan has a really good question: Are you allowed to keep a deer that you hit? That is a great question. It is legal to keep a roadkill deer. You do have to call your local police department um, to fill out just a small amount of paperwork so that you can legally take the deer. Um, but yes, you can keep a deer that you hit if you'd like to harvest it, um, take advantage of the venison. Um, if you see a deer get hit, you are allowed to take it as long as you let the authorities know and, and fill out that little permit form. I know a lot of people that have eaten roadkill deer. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, I guess I guess it depends on the uh what's the word? Not status, but the uh the trauma of the injury. <laughs> yeah. Um, cuz those those innards can be tricky, so Yeah. Uh, please be careful if you are going to be harvesting your roadkill. Um and just uh, be smart and be safe with regard to food safety uh, and all of those things. So I, I see some comments that venison is delicious. It is, I agree. <laughs> and it's it deer hunting season, so you guys get out there, get your permits, and harvest some deer to thin the herd. It'll benefit everyone in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions, so uh, please check out the Rutgers Wildlife Facebook page. Uh, Kathleen's got the link here, and we will be sending out some some resources. The recorded presentation will have the um, the presentation itself, and then 
know, some, some fact sheets and things like that. So we'll be sending those to everyone that participated. So thank you. Uh, the poll is closing. So everybody go ahead and finish that up. Make sure that you submit. I see somebody was saying that they lost their survey. I'm sorry, I cannot restart it for you. Um, but yes, yeah, so Ed says, will there be a recording? Yes, this is being recorded. We will get it out to all the participants uh, in the next week or so. So thank you. And I'd like to thank Kathleen again. And I'd like to thank my my moderator and chat uh, checker, Steve Yurjo from Ocean and Atlantic Counties. Thank you, Steve. We really appreciate you, like your deer antlers. Um, so yeah, so thank you everybody. We appreciate you coming out on this Monday night. It's getting darker earlier and earlier. So glad you could join us. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll see you in the next couple weeks and we really appreciate everyone coming on. So I'm going to stop recording.